The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, and welcome to the ELECTS webinar on Counter, Sushi, and Seru. This webinar serves as our second and final session in our two-part series on standardizing serials. I'm Erin Elzey, a member of the ELECTS Continuing Education Committee, and I'll be your host for today's webinar. Our presenters today are Athena Hepner and Kate Hill. Athena is the Discovery Services Librarian at the University of Central Florida in Orlando. Her career in academic libraries spans over 20 years and over a range of roles in public services, systems, and technical services. In her current role, she jointly oversees the e-resources collection and expenditures, continually strives to improve discovery and access technology, and spends too much time in email and spreadsheets. Her first love remains public service, and she spends four hours per week serving patrons via reference and ask a librarian. Athena's work and research center on applying technology to connect users to connect. Her projects explore user experience, resource discovery services, and other technologies that enhance access to information for individuals. Kate began her library career as an NC State Fellow in the Department of Acquisitions and Discovery, where she focused her energy around creating GoKB, the Global Open Knowledge Base, and became very familiar with the inner workings of KBART and Project Transfer. After her time at NC State, Kate became the Electronic Resources Librarian at UNC Greensboro, where she manages all aspects of electronic resources acquisitions, discovery, and collection development. Currently, she is the chair of the ELECT Continuing Resources Standards Committee and also involved with the planning of Electronic Resources and Libraries Conference, along with far too many other committees. She also co-wrote the book, The ABCs of Electronic Resources Management, a highly practical introduction to working with electronic resources designed for librarians learning on the job. Both Kate and Athena bring much expertise to today's topic and we're fortunate to have them with us. A few logistics for today's presentation. All attendees are muted to prevent background noise and we do not have interactive chat capabilities. You may, however, comment on today's presentation using Twitter. The hashtag is A-L-C-P-S-C-E. We do not monitor the Twitter feed, so if you have questions for Kate and Athena, please type them into the question box on your screen. We will have time for Q&A after the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and you will receive an email with links to the recording and presentation slides shortly after the presentation concludes. And now we'll begin with Athena. There will be a slight delay as we change presenters. Good morning, or I guess afternoon everyone. Uh, can you see my screen and hear me? Well. Someone tell me in via chat if you can't. So um, I, I'm glad to be here today to talk about Counter. Uh, I am a big fan of Counter for a variety of reasons, and I'm just going to launch right in. So before I go too far, let me give you a few caveats and assumptions. I think that most of you probably already know something about Counter, especially Release 4, which is the uh, version that has been in effect for the last several years. And I want you to know that I do not know everything about Counter. I am on the technology advisory group, but I entered that group for Counter relatively late into the, the formation of release five. So I'm trying to catch up and um, it can be pretty technical and specific. So there's a lot of little details that I certainly don't have memorized and I would have to look up if there are questions or refer to other experts. Release 5 is still new and it is evolving. So as I say anything in here, um, it might not be the ultimate truth about something, but I, I hope that I won't stir you too far off and I hope to give you just a, a good basic understanding to go forward with. So counter code of practice is a code of practice that is aimed at vendors. I know we librarians are the ones who ultimately are um, trying to do stuff with our statistics to do cost per use and assess whether something is giving us a good usage levels and make collection decisions and understand what's going on with our users. We do a lot with it, but the 
code of practice itself is interpreted by the vendors and, and applied and then counter has a way to audit to see whether each vendor is complying with the code of practice that is the current one. So here's a, a list of actions that users might take, either users or technology that's acting on behalf of a user, and how it might translate into something that counter is recording as usage. And that's really what's happening. Someone's interacting with a platform in some way, and the platform is recording these interactions in some way, and counter defines how to interpret that and what to count it as. So you can see this is from JSTOR and they talk about download a PDF is turned into an item request and so forth. Counter, of course, it's revision five now, but it, it started way back in about 2003 before Counter came along. We did not really have a consistent way to count stats and you couldn't really compare from one platform to the other. But in 2003, they came up with the first code of practice that covered how to count basic searching, sessions, turnaways, and full text usage. And it's been going since there. I'm not gonna read every step here, but by release four in 2013, there were 24 defined reports of how, what would be included, how it would be formatted, all the metrics that were going to be in which column and so forth. <clears throat> And you can see throughout that they've kept adding new concepts and trying to keep up with technology as it was evolving. And it became rather um, unwieldy and complex. So release five is really kind of a revamp of the whole code of practice. It introduces some new concepts, new terminology and metrics. Um, and one of the really interesting changes is now we have 24 reports. I'm sorry, four reports instead of 24. So it's a big switch. Um, I say four, but I'll get into that a little bit more. But you can see change is constant and uh, counter tries to keep up with it. And it's gone from fairly rough ideas to more and more refined. Now, those four reports I mentioned, these are the four master reports. So there's a database master, title master, item master, and platform master report. And master is just what it sounds like. This is the main report. It's going to try and cover everything that could possibly be known uh, or reported about the database use or the title use uh, would be like for books and journals and so forth. The item use would be things like your your article level use or uh, different th items that are not full titles. Um, and then the platform would be summing up all of the other use types into one summary of the use across an entire platform. So those are the four masters. Within those, there are standard reports that have been defined. And if you look at these, you may get a sense of why they defined some standard reports. These look very similar to the naming scheme that would have been used in counter four, and that's not a coincidence. So you can have these standard reports will help you be able to relate not only to the previous counter four reports, but also, so if you want to compare from um, the database search from this vendor to the database search for that vendor, from a database search from another library, if you all use the dr hyphen or underscore d1, there's no variation in what that report is going to give. So you can say, yes, this is going to give the same counts with the same set of metrics and so forth for all of these different instances. So it allows comparability and the master reports have a lot of flexibility um, in that they can be filtered in a lot of different ways. So you get a, your data stream coming in and then you can apply different filters to view it in different ways. And that's what goes on with these master reports. <clears throat> so you have very flexible request forms that let you describe exactly how you, what you want to see in the, the report. So going, going back one, these standard reports are really just specific filters that are applied the same each time on the master reports. But you can you can create all sorts of different views, um, innumerable different ways you can look at the data that's available in the master reports. Filtering by dates or content types or metrics types, years of publication and so forth. 
So I mentioned before that those uh, standard reports probably look familiar. Um, it's sort of a tomato tomato almost, except there are differences. Um, but this is how the standard reports are like this. Um, and they line up with the old R4 reports pretty well. So the old BR1 full text request at the book level could be the TR underscore BR1 in counter five. And um, you can see here that that would be taking the unique title request and the data type equals books and the section type equals books is, would be the parameters to result in the TRB, TR underscore B1. Uh, there is a guide to this crosswalk and uh, the URL is large there down at the bottom and it describes each of the main R4 reports and the R5 equivalents. So you don't have to try and figure it out all on your own, but um, you can play around with some of the filters and so forth to, to try and refine it how you would prefer. So if you're looking closely at that, and I've already mentioned several metric types and so forth that are new, and it might be kind of unfamiliar, and I've tossed up this, this diagram that, you know, it looks sort of weird and no one would know what it was unless you had a pretty good explanation. So let me launch into the explanation of some of these new terms and concepts. These are all the attributes that are available to be displayed in the R5 reports. <clears throat> so there's 37 different data elements that might be in a report um, most of these will not appear in all the reports. In fact, in the platform reports, you're only going to see these five plus the monthly usage logs. Um, the data reports, ha the reports has more, then titles has even more, and then the item report, which is a new type of report, has something like, uh, that's 30, uh, six, I think it was, I, I'd have to count again, but it includes most of the attributes that were on the previous slide. A lot of these attributes are really about identifying the item in question. So lots of IDs, which I think is fantastic because this gives us the, the linkages to be able to take these reports and start comparing to other things such, such as our invoices or the KMART or other types of information about the items that are reported in counter statistics. So we can have tools for linking them or identifying the individual items. So a lot of IDs, but these are my favorite metrics. So we've got data type, section type, access type, access method, and metric type. So let's go into those a little bit. So the data type, counter has taken where, uh, before we would have information about the usage on an item and you'd see a title and the platform and the publisher and you'd probably know whether it was a, a book or book chapter or article or journal um though we didn't really get into article level reports but now we have all these uh we have all of these values for data type that we didn't necessarily have details for or consistently available in the past. Now these are available and they're available in each report type. So I could do comparisons across different reports of how my uh, thesis or dissertations are being used or my newspapers and newsletters and so forth. So I'm very happy to see this data type metric. Section type is a little bit more straightforward. It's just what you would think. It's only available in item and title master reports um, and the sub reports. Uh, access type has got some new information in there. Before we would have um, some reporting of gold OA in the journal reports, uh, but now we have gold APC, gold non-APC, and other free to read. The OA delayed will be perhaps fleshed out in the future. It's not done yet. Uh, but, and then there's controlled, which would be any access that's requiring a login or registration. Anything that's behind some sort of authentication method is going to be called controlled. So even if it's uh, register for free to see this open access article, that would still be counted as a controlled access. So you can't necessarily assume that just because something is labeled as controlled, that the article or journal is not OA. But this does give us a little bit more information than we had before. 
access method is new as well. And we've got regular, which is consider what we have right now. And then TDM is text and data mining. So this is sort of preparing for the eventuality that there could be a lot of use of our material, very high volume of use through text and data mining. So you can separate that out and not think that, okay, this journal is suddenly being used 10,000 times, whereas before it was only five times a semester. You'd be able to understand that someone downloaded it to do some TDM and assessment of the text. All right, um, the next metric type, uh, or the next, next datum is the metric type, which is really reporting on what use was made. And uh, I've put over here bolding for investigations, requests, and searches. And you can see they're repeated three times. And then uh, down at the bottom is limit exceeded and no license. Let me talk about those first. Those are new in that, uh, they before we had turnaways and now we have more details about why there was a turnaway so it could be that we just didn't have recognized rights to get to that item or it could be that we have a set, a set number of users and this would be the one person beyond that or how many ever users beyond the allowed usage so you can get a sense of whether or not you uh, need to add more users or whether it's something you should pick up a license to it gives you more detail searches is a little bit different too you've got regular and before we had automated and federated but now uh, they're separated out so regular is not necessarily exactly what you'd think regular is going to be anytime you go in to either one database or if the user has selected the databases by hand so take the instance where i go into my um, engineering village platform and i have two databases on there inspec and compendex a user links on, uh, to it they do a search and it's searching both of those databases automatically that would be considered searches automated it's not exactly what you would think because there's only two databases and they're closely related but still because the user did not specifically select those two databases it's considered automated selection uh, they would have to have specifically selected one or the other or both in order for it to be considered regular federated is still what you would think for that it's a search that's being broadcast or being sent across a whole uh, bunch of databases automatically um, from the not usually from the host platform um, <clears throat> And then platform would be the searches that are run across a platform, just as you would expect. Uh, now, I'm gonna dig a little bit more into these upper ones, spend a little time on this, because you notice that there's a pattern. There's total versus unique, item versus title, and investigations versus request. And they uh, each have a combination for each of those. So first, investigations versus request. All the interactions, whether it's viewing an abstract or linking to a resolver or looking at the full text, are considered interactions. So anytime someone clicks on something to do one of those things, it would be counted as an interaction. A request is when someone is trying to get to the full content. So a request is a type of interaction, but not all requests or not all investigations are requests. Uh, the old abstract view and result clicks are gone and now they're just counted as an investigation. So here's a total versus unique. So if I have a person come in and they click on an abstract, they click on, click on a cited reference and they click on a PDF, that's going to be, and the when they click on um, say the abstract, the HTML auto loads, um, that would be four interactions because the, they viewed an HTML, they clicked on these things, so four total interactions. But it's only one unique item, so so it's one one um, investigation for a unique item and four investigations total. It's also one unique item request. All right. So it can be a little uh, difficult to wrap your head around that. It took me reading three things uh, four or five times before it started to sink in. But there's some really good scenarios that you can read through. Let me back up. Um, I put the link down here at the bottom. 
Oop, sorry, previous. But if you read through this investigations and requests, it explains it quite clearly. All right, so those are some of the metrics, but how do you get them? Just as before, you'd be going to each of the vendor sites to try and get the reports that you want to see. And uh, here's an example report form from Adipon. And you can see I can choose uh, the year I want, <clears throat> the type of report I want. And if I were, if this were a live drop down, you'd see I would have all of the master reports, all the standard reports as options. If I choose a master report, then I get all of these filter options where I can choose metric type, data type, and so forth. So you have a lot of control and granularity that you can choose. And you'll end up with a report that looks something like this. There's a lot to like about the new format for the reports they're delivered in. Tab separated value is the default that will be offered. They, you might also see Excel offered as a download or email option, but TSV is the default that they need to offer. It's always going to have these 12 first 12 rows for the, describing what the report is, when it was generated, what the parameters were, the uh, who you know platform that created it, and so forth. And then the the set of uh, columns at first will be consistent too for the different master report types and uh, the standard reports are, are very consistent. So here's my TR underscore JR1 for JSTOR and I have in this report it's going to tell me the total item requests and the unique item request. So 81,000 unique items had 106,000 interactions of some sort. Um, and uh, in this case, it's full text interactions. So if I were to compare that to my JR1 from the R4, it looks similar, but you can see there's some issues. Uh, the headers are a little bit different. The, oops, previous, sorry about that. Uh, okay, the, there's no space between the column, uh, the, the row between, the uh, description of the report and the the title row for the headers and the, there's an extra row for the totals so it makes it very difficult to just start working with the data with the data as an excel spreadsheet whereas in the counter five you've got this nice empty row so you can select all of the data elements and start working them you can filter on them and uh so forth without having to deal with the header sort of interfering with the rest of the data. I'm not making that entirely clear, I, I apologize. But uh, I do want to point out that my unique item request, or my total item request, 106,000, compares very closely to what uh, I was seeing in my JIR1 R4 reports for that same period. Um, there's a little bit of differences, and you probably will see differences because of slight changes to how things are counted in the code of practice, but they should be very similar and won't raise too many eyebrows comparing if you're tracking from year to year for your R4 to your R5 reports for the standard reports. Okay, moving on quickly because I'm running out of time. A new thing that's been added into these reports that's not exactly a metric or anything it's um, you can see listed here as a platform is distributed usage logging and this is where you can have the vendors can choose to have other platforms report the usage that happens there on their material like in this case science direct wants to say that there is their articles hosted on mendeley that was used some number of times so they have got the distributed usage logging coming in from Mendeley to, and they include it in their title reports. So I can, I can count that usage along with my usage on ScienceDirect, which is, I think, an area that's going to expand. Right now, there's not very many external sites that are providing DUL, but uh, because ScienceDirect and Mendeley are, well, owned by ScienceDirect or Elsevier, they uh, are pulled in nicely. All right, so as we all know, we don't wanna just look at the spreadsheets and do nothing with them, but there's a lot you can do with these sheets that has gotten easier now that this, the, it's got all these identifiers that are being applied. 
um, consistently, and the reports are laid out nicely. So there's ways you could take your KBART holdings and um, match it to your TR reports to show the titles that had zero usage, for instance. Zero usage is no longer reported anywhere. Um, so this is the only way you would be able to do it, is get your KBART holdings file and do a cross comparison with your title report and you'd be able to see which ones had no use. You could take your invoices if you've got the ISSNs or ISBNs and then take your database use or your title use and get your cost per use that way. You can analyze by all sorts of different metric types <clears throat> and of course all of this could be done in Excel or whatever tool you prefer. Um, but the, there's a caveat here. Uh, it, the reports can be quite large. I tried doing some analysis on my title report from ProQuest and I saw this spinning wheel uh, a lot because if I have I, the, my spreadsheet, I think had 600,000 elements in it, something like that, and uh, or 600,000 rows in it. And I think it was about 12 elements in our columns. So it was a lot to deal with. It was hard for any of the functions to function. In addition, there's still some problems that are uh, not going away. The ISSNs, DOIs, and other IDs are not necessarily applied universally. Some of the reports may have them while others don't. Um, some of your invoices have them while others don't. There's title variations, single line invoices. Uh, the OA usage, if your users didn't authenticate in any way or didn't come through your IP, it may be invisible. So you, you may be even seeing a lot of usage there. And the different platform designs result in different usage patterns. So it's really hard to, even though we're getting consistent looking reports, you can't necessarily interpret them consistently. They don't reveal user experience, intent, engagement, content value, or impact. So um, counter is great and I love it, but it's not going to tell you everything you might want to know. Uh, I want to take just a few moments though to talk about sushi. And um, as you probably know, Sushi is used to harvest counter data from the different vendors without you having to go to the platform and fill out those forms to request the reports in each time. Um, it's automated harvesting and they are updating it to match R5. They're also updating it from the old technology SOAP to using RESTful. And this is starting to get, I'm just sort of parroting these words. Don't ask me to describe exactly what those mean. This is very technical and I'm not that technical. The results are returned in JSON format, which is a, an XML looking file. You can read it, um, but you would need something that can turn that into a, a system that to display the data the way you want it or to convert into a database. Um, <clears throat> you can use APIs to pull the data and you can also construct a URL to pull individual piece of, pieces of data. You don't have to get the whole role. Um, so if I want to see usage just for one ISSN, I could construct a URL to send the request off to get it from whichever platform. Um, and this is sort of how the URLs are constructed, but I found it's not consistent from vendor to vendor. So this gives you an idea of what to do, but you would look at each vendor's instructions to see how to use their API or construct the URL. And then you'd be able to get one individual piece of data. Um, I'm running short on time and I want to make sure there's plenty of time for my co-presenter and for questions. So I'm going to leave you with some links to some more ways to learn. The, these are how I've been learning. There's a, a series of uh, foundation classes, the last link here. There's a grow, It's a growing series. It's on YouTube and you can watch the videos. They're usually three to five minutes each. So it's not a really long, tedious thing. And these friendly guides I found extremely helpful for laying out what are the metrics, what are the allowed values, and so forth that you're going to see in the reports, and which uh, master reports provide which elements, and so forth. All right, so thank you very much. And with that, I'll hand it over to Kate to talk about Seru. Well, hi, everyone. As I said, uh, my name's 
Kate Hill, and uh, I am going to be talking to you today about Seru. Uh, I am the, uh, so Seru is kind of a, I'm actually basing this presentation more on that you might not be as familiar with what Seru is, so I apologize if you are like, I am an old hat at Seru and I know everything about it. Uh, I will be talking a bit about how we use Seru in our own workflow uh, and best practices and tips and things like that a little bit later on in this uh, presentation. So hopefully that'll be helpful to you if you are an expert in Seru um, already. But if not, I also am going to be talking a little bit about the background and uh, basics of this, this kind of standard. It's a weird standard. So Seru, which stands for the Shared Electronic Resource Understanding, because everything needs an acronym, um, was created in 2008 and it is supported by NISO. Uh, it continues to be updated and used. It had its last major update. Uh, in 2014, but it just had an, it has a brand new website from a, uh, about a year ago. So this is something that has been continued to be looked at and, and brought up to date. Uh, as part of that, it has originally focused, originally focused on e-journals, but it has been expanded to look at e-books especially, and we have used it for streaming media as well at UNCG. Uh, it was developed in a response to the idea of the model license you probably have heard of, or maybe have heard of the two of the major ones, Lib license from the uh, CRL and uh, the California Digital, Digital Library model license. Um, those are mostly examples of language that is considered good or beneficial for library resource use that libraries can help them use to help them negotiate and modify existing publisher licenses. So Siru looked at that and said that it didn't want to be modular like that. It kind of wanted to be it's a full thing that librarians could just use with publishers as is. Um, this means, however, that it is not a license. It is actually uh, basically an agreement between two entities um, that say they understand how certain materials will be used and that they will expect that these materials will be used according to law and in good faith. It's a good faith act of trust agreement. Because of this, because it is meant to be, uh, it, it doesn't include all aspects of something that you might see in a license. Um, this especially means it doesn't include things such as unique business terms. Um, uh, this includes some of the things that you kind of can see up there. Uh, those often have to be added as separate to a separate purchase order or recorded in an email or worked out with the uh, publisher individually and then saved. They are not included as part of the Sarah document. It also does not use legal language, so you will not use, see terms like licensor, jurisdiction, or warranties. However, uh, it does include some standard areas of licensing, which I will be going through in a very exciting fashion, uh, what all it does actually includes, include. Uh, if you want to, so before I go into that though, right, I have this slide. So, this, these, and these are all going to have, I'm going to have links to all of these sites at the end of this presentation. So more resources forthcoming. But the way that you become part of NISO, uh, sorry, of CERO is that you sign up basically through a Google form on their website. And you need to simply list an uh, institution, your contact, email and telephone number. Uh, and then you have agreed basically that publishers, that you are a, a, a library willing to use Seru. Obviously, uh, before you do this, I would recommend actually talking to more people than just instead of just being like, yep, yeah, we're going to use Seru and it's going to be great. Uh, probably bring it up with your coworkers and get them on board. But that is how you sign up. And there is an ongoing and regularly updated registry on their website to show you all libraries, consortia and publishers that have agreed to use Seru. So these are some of the, I'm gonna go through the parts of Seru now. Uh, the acquisition is basically, this is the business terms. Uh, it's basically just is saying there are going to be business terms somewhere else. Uh, it's pretty basic. It does, does say that the provider has secured rights necessary. So it does guarantee that the provider has not been breaking copyright uh, to give you the materials. It includes a section on acquiring institution and its authorized users. We include, I'm showing you the academic library's definition. It also has a public library's definition of academic user, authorized users. We usually, uh, when we're doing it, remove that public library's uh, explanation because we are not a public library. And we usually change the first sentence 
up here to just say that the acquiring institution is a single institution uh, because UNCG is, but that doesn't need to be done. But basically it just says who your authorized users are. We're pretty happy with their definition and feel very confident with using it. It's pretty standard according to many model licenses. Use of materials is simply saying, hey, we can use copyright. It falls under copyright, it falls under fair use. Uh, I didn't include it, but it also lists about information about ILL and sharing of articles and chapters for scholarship. This section does not include any information about ILL for whole eBooks. If you want to include that, that has to be added or negotiated. Uh, inappropriate use, this is your kind of standard, what you'd see at a model license of, we cannot police users. If you think that something is being used wrong in a license, uh, you have a right to shut off that use, and but you need to let us know, and we need to, and then we need to work together to restore the use. Uh, again, we keep this language mostly as is. Um, it asks, it does ask for good faith on part of the publisher uh, that it won't overuse this. So you have to trust your publisher a bit that they will not overdo what they consider harmful uh, but we really appreciate that it uh, adds the section about cannot control user behavior then there's a confidential and privacy statement uh, pretty simple basically don't share users says don't share our user data online performance and service provisions please keep everything the, we expect the publishers to actually keep things up to date and do regular maintenance uh, we really like the fact that it adds the fact that publishers will recognize the importance of working with industry standards and best practices. Yay, standards. I mean, this is an entire webinar about standards. Uh, the one thing I'll say here is that sometimes if we're working with new publishers or people who haven't worked with libraries before, they get a little bit confused about what some of these standards are when we're trying to introduce Sarah to them. So that does take a bit of time to explain some of these standards, uh, but usually that, that works through and we get to educate publishers in the meantime. And finally, we have archiving and perpetual access. This is very vague. This is something else that we basically will often elaborate on in our business terms uh, about if it's a subscription or perpetual access, and if it is being archived or perpetual access, what exact format that is taking, because this says it can happen, but it doesn't get put much specificity. So as you can see, there's not a lot of specified. It is a much more vague document than a license and is about good faith. Uh, because of this, it is essential for some of those details to be saved and clarified somewhere else. So I just wanted to kind of, that's a lot, and I wanted to explain a little bit about how we actually use this um, to make it a little bit more understandable about how it can be used. Um, so UNCG is registered as a Sarah library. Uh, we decided to uh, use it for um, small publishers that often don't have a license or with whom we are getting a small amount of content from. And these are some examples of some of the publishers we have used Sarah with. So how we do this is we, every time we are starting to work with a new publisher, um, we have built into our licensing workflow to go to the NYSU Sarah registry for publishers. And we're going to check to see if our publisher that we're working with is on this list. And we're going to see if the product that we're working with also falls into what can be covered with Seru. This is not super visible, but over here, uh, there's a column on publishers that say what products are actually covered um, by Seru for individual publishers. So if we notice that our publisher and their, the product we're trying to license is covered by Seru, we usually simply ask if reference this registry and say, ask if they would be willing to use Cero and figure out business terms from there. If they're not on the list and they are a new publisher and we are not buying a huge amount of them or spending well with them, which we usually limit up to about $10,000, uh, we will use phrasing kind of similar to what you use on, see on the screen to ask if they would be interested in using Cero. And we've actually gotten numerous people to agree. Uh, we actually got Publishers Weekly to agree to this and Northeastern Press for the Project Women's Writers are two of the project or two of the big ones who had not used Sarah before and uh, started using Sarah because we asked them. 
Uh, we keep a running list of publishers not on the registry who have either said yes or no in the past. If they have a very negative reaction, we certainly note that. Um, for example, don't ask New York Review of Books. They will not say yes. Uh, if they have said yes in the past, we don't want to assume that they will say yes in the future, especially if they've not put themselves on the registry yet, but we do remind them of our previous agreement and see if they will say yes again. So, sorry, I'm trying to find. So this is an example of, uh, I'm trying to find where I put this. Uh, this is an example of what we also will use this for sometimes is to, uh, this is an example of us putting our business terms in. So what, as you can see here, uh, we have agreed that we were going to use Seru and that we actually had to do a little bit extra on ILL because there was a little bit more that was required. So I would save all of these emails. I have them all saved in our uh, licensing 2000 whatever year that license is and I will treat them like it is a license and save all of this material. We also have used these two, uh, especially with streaming media, to make a, uh, as our terms. So often we are, if we're working with small independent films and things like that, there will be, um, people will ask us for our terms, like what is your license? Well, we at UNCG don't have a license. When we are asked that kind of thing, we send them our SARU terms. Um, and see if they are willing to agree to those. And again, we have, this is an example of a person who I, I've sent this to, and we have gotten a decent, I would say it's about 50-50 on getting people to agree to do SARU when we send them this as our terms. So summing up, as I said, this is gonna do this one fast. Um, SARU is great because it is much less time consuming than licensing. Business terms have to be figured out anyway, and this allows us to quickly agree to terms and get material set up. For those who agree to Saro, it takes an average of four emails to get everything figured out. Our last Springer license, for, and on the other hand, took over six months of negotiation and is still ongoing. It helps libraries get better terms. The focus on fair use, not policing users, and privacy is very important and often models what is in the model license, and it makes sure that we get these vital terms for our users. It allows us as a state institution to not have to deal with things like warranties and jurisdiction and what court should handle what terms and if there's a denimification, uh, all these big old legal terms, which means that we less like, are less likely to have to go to our university council, which is great because that takes a really long time. And it's also small publisher friendly because it lets people who don't have licensed teams or don't even have licensed terms maybe, such as small independent film studios and bookshop publishers, sign an agreement and feel like they've done something to protect their materials while at the same time not having to come up with an entire license or such from scratch. It's not great, so there are some downsides. Uh, you can suggest it to vendors, and as I said, sometimes they don't bite. It should never be forced on vendors, even though I know I try to make a good pitch. Often they're just like, nope, we want to do a normal license. And so because of this, this does wait, I guess if you look at it, it can waste some time because then we have to go into license negotiation after I asked about Sarah, but at most it usually is going to take two emails to have that conversation and have them turn you down. So it's not that much wasted time, and you save so much time if they actually agree. It's also really hard to use with big vendors. Um, I have never successfully used this on any products with any of our like large journal or book publishers. It also leaves a lot of things in good faith. So it depends on how risk averse your library is. If you are comfortable with vague language, like we are often at UNCG, Sarah can work really well. If you want terms and things like that spelled out very specifically, licensing is usually the better way to go. Cero is not going to get that kind of specificity. And finally, it is a new workflow step. We've had to add this into our licensing workflow and sometimes we forget. And vendors, I have discovered, even if they are Cero registered, will not bring up the fact that they are Cero registered uh, and will just present you with a license often. So it takes time and it, you have, you as the, it's often is on you as the librarian to whoever the librarian is to remind vendors about Sarah or ask. 
And as I said, uh, here, as I, this is going to be sent out to folks, but here are some resources uh, about uh, uh, Seru, the official page, how to register is down there, um, the full recommended practice if you really want to read all that language. Uh, and I really like the getting started and good business terms, uh, especially the good business terms kind of helps you figure out if we're using Seru, what other material might you need to ask for that is not included in Seru. So uh, that's it for me. Um, and Erin, do you want to talk about yeah. questions? Absolutely. Thank you, Kate. Um, so there was a lot of information that we covered in this session. And if you do have questions and have not done so yet, now is the time to go ahead and type your questions into that question box in your go to control panel. Um, and if they are for a specific presenter or regarding a specific tool, please try to include that. So we did have a few come in in regards to counter. So these are for Athena. And the first one is Athena, where can we learn more about the meaning of the attributes? Uh, so, for example, uh, what exactly is meant by access type or book request? The code of practice, of course, is the authoritative source. And you can get to that if you Google counter code of practice 5 or counter R5, it will come up. But I recommend going to the friendly guide for librarians or the friendly guide for providers. Both are useful. Um, and that's, uh, I think, a little bit easier to grasp than diving straight into the code of practice. But on the code of practice, there's a nice glossary, and you can search for any term that's unfamiliar, and it tries to explain it. Sometimes it's a little confusing still, but uh, those are the sources that I would turn to. There's also a discussion list, and I don't remember the email address off the top of my head, and I don't want to open my email right now that uh, is for librarians who want to follow what's going on with counters. So you can subscribe to that and you can ask questions there. Great, thank you. And then we have another one that's more specific about one of the attributes is what does the APC mean as in gold APC and gold non-APC? Ah, now I always get this acronym wrong. Um, it's not article publication charge, um, but that's the basic concept. I, the, APC, uh, but it's for the things that the, the there was a charge to publish the specific item. And Is it that author publication paid. charge? That could be it, yes. Okay, I think that's what it, I'm, I'm gonna look it up. Again, I don't want to switch off and Google right now, but it's, that's a, something that the author or someone paid to have the item published as open access. Great, thank you. And now we have one on Sushi. Uh, so what technology is needed on another institution's end to acquire data through Sushi? Sushi, it's gotten much easier with Counter 5. Um, if you ask Oliver Pesh, he says, oh, this is easy. Um, for me, it looks a little technical still. But if you, have, if you go to the vendor site and they offer Sushi as an option, they will tell you what you need to do to get their Sushi. And with R5, you uh, can construct that URL that I talked about. Uh, it will be some sort of host name domain for um, their sushi providing site and then uh, the rest of it is just sort of uh, describing the content that you want to get uh, in a very specific way so if you construct that url you can go out and pull out up a sushi file on the fly from anywhere um, if you have the right id uh, so you definitely will need to contact the vendor and get the right credentials to put into the url you also can use a harvester um, and the harvesters are not really there yet for instance sfx it used to do sushi sushi harvesting for the previous release is never going to harvest any r5 counter unfortunately um, then there's some issues with some of the other harvesting services out there. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm rambling a little bit, but one, you can go out and get the, the JSON file through a Sushi URL on your own, or two, you can enter it, the credentials into a harvesting service. Um, you just get the credentials from the vendor just like you would have for the previous Sushi. Uh, let me know if that didn't clarify or it didn't answer the question. 
Great, thank you. And thank you, we did have a couple of our attendees chime in that APC stands for Article Processing Charge. Okay. Article okay. Processing Charge. Oh. <laughs> I think everyone's so helpful. <laughs> um, so we have another one regarding both sushi and counter. Since counter four and five are both functional at this point, is sushi able to use both? Um, they are different. So you would have to have, there, Sushi 4 is still out there. It's not Sushi 4, but Sushi 4 R4 is still out there. So if you have it working in a system, it's not broken. Um, unless the vendor has decided to disable that on their servers. Uh, it is a vendor by vendor thing. So as far as I know, no vendor would have turned off the Sushi harvesting for R4 counter. Um, <clears throat> but I could be wrong. The R5 is still being brought up, but if, if it's offered the, I have seen vendors that are offering sushi in for R4 and R5. There's no conflict. It's just a matter of what, what the vendors want to continue to support. Thank However, you. I should say oh. that the counter R5 would have come online um, for 2019. So you probably will not see any way to get the uh, the statistics for for 2018 or earlier delivered via Sushi as R4. Um, I'm sorry, R as R5. You're not going to be able to re retroactively convert those statistics into R5 either through Sushi or otherwise. Okay. Um, so the next question we have is for Kate, and Kate, you had mentioned that if your institution is going to use SARU, that they should, you know, make sure with their institution that it's a good idea. Can you talk mm -hmm. about what that process looked like at your institution? Was there any pushback? Um, what convinced you to use SARU? So um, at our institution, uh, there w what we basically what was the reason, main reason we really decided to go to Seru was actually because we kept on getting these um, quest asking for our terms um, from some small ebook providers and from some streaming media providers. UNCG was really, really early in streaming media use. And so that was, so it was kind of, I actually had come from NC State, uh, where one of the people who had created uh, Seru had worked. And so I was very familiar with it at that point. And because of that, uh, brought it into a conversation um, here as, as a, a solution for that problem. But once we were registered, we realized we could use it for other things as well. Um, so I just brought it up with our uh, associate, our head of collections. And that was a, it was a, it's a very easy thing to implement um, because it is non-technical. It, requ you know, it requires no technology except email and a Google form. Um, and the big thing is if you are, as again, if you're a really, a really risk in adverse institution, so I'm not, so I just brought that up and I was like, read this over, does this look okay? And my collections person was like, yeah, that looks great. Let's let us try to use it. Um, I have not heard of many people running into like having to give it to the university council because it is not a legally binding document. Um, but that's the reason I am saying that you want to, if you know that your institution is more risk averse, you might want to bring it up, especially to the heads of collections or something like that, just to make sure that they're okay with you using something that is not a legally binding document. But I just presented it, shared it with them, presented and gave them a reason why it solved one of our problems um, and it worked. <laughs> uh, it, it's very pretty, pretty simple to, to explain and, and um, get people on board just by saying, hey, this is gonna save us, this will save us time. Okay, thank you. And we do have one more question that came in and back to Athena. Uh, for using Sushi, are you familiar with the, with the firm scholarlyiq.com? They seem to have a product that is able to work with Sushi. I have heard of Scholarly IQ, yeah. Um, and 
Um, I'm not familiar with them enough to speak to whether or not they do sushi harvesting well, uh, but there are several services out there. Um, I think Redlink is one. Uh, there's, uh, of course, uh, different ERMs might have something that can harvest sushi. Um, I don't know what to say. I, I can't speak to them specifically. I apologize. Oh, that's okay. Um, so that will wrap up our Q&A portion then. And we are glad that all of our attendees could be with us today. Uh, you will all receive a short of online evaluation form. So if you could please take a few minutes to respond to the questions and know that your comments are very valuable and help the ELECT's Continuing Education Committee plan future events. And this email will also include the links to today's slides and recordings. So you'll be able to see all of those links that Athena and Kate had included in their presentation. And you'll also have the opportunity to receive a certificate of attendance. So that information will be in your email. And thank you once again to our presenters, Athena Hepner and Kate Hill. And thanks also to members of the Continuing Education Committee, Joseph Nicholson and Wanda Javieri, and to Alana Warren from the ELECT office. The support they provide make it possible for us to present these webinars. ELECT has other continuing education events coming up. We have two more webinar events this season, both of which are virtual pre-conferences. The next webinar will be Tuesday, June 4th on Organizing for Change, which is part of the virtual pre-conference on advocating for your department and library. Please see the ELECT website to register or to find more information on these. And ELECT also offers web courses, which are four to six weeks long, as well as two-day email discussions. Our next e-forum will be on July 23rd, discussing streaming media collections. Check the website for information on upcoming courses and discussions. Once again, thank you all for joining us today, and this will conclude our session.